Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with luminary custom knife maker, Steve Ryan. Steve was a seminal member of the tactical folder genre, making a name and a reputation for himself on his heavy-duty folders with unique profiles, complex milling and surface treatments uh, with a healthy portion of menace. Uh, His engineering prowess and a love of knives landed him a position with Surefire, heading up their weapons division. Since his corporate days, Ryan's custom knife making has hit a new pace, with a new and ex- with new and extravagant builds popping up on Instagram daily, which I drool over, uh, if I'm being honest. And I'm honored to have Steve Ryan on the show to find out about the past, present, and future of knives from his perspective. But first, like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell. You know that whole speech. And uh, be sure to download us wherever you listen uh, to your podcasts. Any podcast app, you'll find us there. And join us on Patreon, where you get all sorts of extra knife content and perks. Uh, just check it out on the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Do you like the sound of the alphanumeric combinations M390, 204P, and 20CV, but bristle at 8CR, 13MOV, and AUS-8? You are a knife junkie, probably worse. Steve, welcome to the show. It's good to see you, sir. Thanks for inviting me. It's nice to see you, too. Well, um, as I mentioned up front, you have been um, making tactical knives, tactical folding knives, and fixed blades uh, for a long time. You've been, um, you know, you were around at the sort of birth of this this style of knife that we all love, and... um, uh i'm very happy to have you on the show i love your designs your work is is really unique and also uh it fills it ticks a bunch of boxes for me uh unique menacing big sturdy build i'm sorry to go on at length but how did you get into this how did you get into knives and building i was a martial arts kid like so many of us and there was I would go to gun shows with my dad and there would always be a knife maker there that had stuff you couldn't just buy. And I spent a lot of time in a karate dojo, you know, thinking about this and that and just said, dad, I want to do this. And my dad was super cool. And he started buying me my first tools, um, really horrible two by 48 belt sanders and, you know, whatever he could get at Harbor Freight tools. And, um, I took off at it and uh, turned out pretty good at it, like right off the bat. I mean, I typically struggle with a lot of things. I'm a fairly slow learner, but usually when I get going, I'm pretty good at it after that. But knife making, I kind of just took to it. And he was always supportive, so he got me that first set of tools. And by the time I was a junior in high school... I had decided I'm going to do this. So I wrote a business plan to my rich grandfather and borrowed $3,000 in 1984 dollars to buy my first set of knife making tools. And if you can imagine, considering I have attachments on machines that cost more than that now, you know, 3000 bucks wasn't a lot of money, but when you're 17, it is. So and I bought my first set of tools, a Blade Master grinder and, um, you know, a Harbor Freight bandsaw and buffer and stuff like that. And I took to it in the garage of my Bakersfield home and uh, just never really stopped. And that was, I think I bought those tools in 83, maybe 84, and I've never stopped. Been at it all along. Um, I did my first knife show as an exhibit exhibitor in, I think it was the Great Western Gun Show back in Pomona in Building 5 or something like that. One of those obscure shows back in the 80s, um, followed by the Soldier of Fortune show in oh, cool. 1984 when I was a senior, 85, I was a senior in high school. 
And I sat up there next to Bob Trizola and Al Mar when Al was still alive. Oh, cool. So I was literally bolting together Kydex sheets in my booth in the Soldier of Fortune show in Las Vegas back that early. Well, let me ask you this. So 17, 1984. Um, uh, nowadays, if you want to get into knife making, you can take a class on YouTube. You can you can go on Instagram and look at a million different knife makers and and be influenced and and uh, inspired there. In the 80s, it was different, obviously. What? How did you get inspiration, and where did you uh, get exposed to different knives and knife makers? Well, I would go to the what used to be called the Anaheim Knife Show every year. That was Dan Delavan show that later became the California Custom Knife Show. Um, I would go to gun shows, the Great Western Gun Show. My dad had an FFL, and we were gun people, so... Um, we would always go to things like that. And I drew a lot. I had ideas of things I couldn't just get. And back in the day, we got the the Atlanta Cutlery Catalog and the Cold I Steel Catalogs. That. and Yeah, right. And you know, back in the days where Banana Republic sold safari clothes, <laughs> and, right? You know, yeah, you'd get yeah. the catalog. and um, It was all was drawn the, out. <laughs> Museum Replicas Limited had all of right. the crazy Chris swords and stuff like that. Um, I made my first karambits for Chris Cutlery, um, Cecil back in, oh God, I think 83 or 84. Modular That's karambits. way before karambits were cool. <laughs> you know, there was a, there was a knife that used to be in the, that was, a, I think one ad in the shotgun news, they called a ninja knife. And it was a one piece steel body karambit. And it just made sense. Mm. So I, I made one in my home garage my, with my dad's tools, grounded on a stone wheel bench grinder, and I had the first karambit. Um, and I never really stopped making those. I've, I've been pretty prolific at that particular design. Um, I've made a lot of aluminum ones that later on turned out to be other people's product lines done a lot of that for people over the years and uh for the most part kept my mouth shut about it but done a lot of that wait, wait, wait. Um, I, I don't understand what you mean aluminum ones you mean trainers or so so back in the day uh in when i was working at b&b guns in westminster california i made aluminum training knives for the local knife fighting teachers and some of those were karambits which got used in classes and videos and later on became named after those people. But they started with me and then um, some of them I even got paid for, but most I didn't, you know, it was just stuff I did. Um, there is a lot of that stuff around from in guys like the, the modern collectors dads had my stuff. Cause you know, I only really got noticed in publicly in 2000 but i had been doing it for quite some time before that and i sold a lot of knives out of the uh b&b guns shop um i would make make took all my knife making equipment from my bakersfield shop sometime in the um like 91 or 92 and then brought it to the back room of b&b &B, and i would make knives and put them in the display case there and from there, I met a whole bunch of cool people because that was the biggest gun store in the world. What was your breakout knife? What was the knife uh, that exposed you to the nation and the world? Well, I was published in Blade Magazine the first time in 99 mm -hmm. with some of the first folding knives I'd ever made. Um, and they were, some of them were flat out copies of Ernie Emerson knives because I was a big fan of his and so I made a couple for myself and then sent them off to the Blade Show with Les Robertson, who then got them published, much to my terror and pleasure <laughs> at the same time. Yeah. Right. So and then you fast forward, all this stuff was happening kind of at once. I had started work at Surefire. I had gone to the police academy. 
Um, it was the old days where with affirmative action, I was the wrong shape and size for that job, or at least what was favorable. Mm -hmm. And so I was, I got done with the police academy. I went back to B and B guns. And one day John Matthews, who was my regular customer walked in the office and said, you want to come work for me? And I said, yes. And a couple of days later I was working there and about six months later, blade magazine happened. And then about six months after that, I kind of a course of, it was almost like Marilyn Monroe sitting at the bar counter. The, uh, the editor of American Handgunner magazine, Cameron Hopkins, was training knife fighting stuff with Steve Tarani. Mm -hmm. And it was a fairly close knit circle of people there in Southern California that everybody knew each other. You know, I had been to, Dan and Santo's place and gave Dan a knife and been to all kinds of different training things. Um, but it really kicked off when I had lunch with Cameron and Cameron goes, Hey, I'm going to put you in American handgunner magazine. <laughs> so if you think about that at the time I was living in a converted one car, well, I was living in an apartment in long beach and all of my tools were now no longer at B and B they were in a converted one car garage with a single light socket plug <laughs> in Long Beach, California, down on Second Street. And Cameron says, I'm going to put you in American Handgunner Magazine because we're featuring the top 10 knife makers in the world. So think about how this goes in reality of things. Here I am. I've been published once. From that, I did a bunch of magazine, did a bunch of catalog requests, but I didn't have a catalog yet. And within a couple of months of that, I was featured in a giant ass magazine. Cameron did my, my catalog, Steve Ryan Knives catalog. I was working at Surefire at the time uh, in customer service, running tech support and repairs. And I literally did line drawings of the models, which some of which had yet to be made for a catalog that Cameron then published. And during this thing, during all of the, the hustle and bustle of um, getting knives off to Ichiro Nagata, the photographer, he got the first six or seven real folders I had ever made, which were the same ones that had been to the Blade Show not long earlier. And those ended up in American Handgunner Magazine, as Steve Ryan is this super cool guy that's been around forever. But the reality was the knives that were published were the first ones of their kind I'd ever made. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden I was popular, like crazy popular. And then the agreement with the Chiro Nagata was that I would sell all the knives to him because he wanted to represent me in Japan. And he started putting me in other magazines. So before you know it, Within a year's time, I had been in four publications. This was real early. This was 2000. And then I was taking catalog orders from and catalog requests for people um, and filling those and still working at Shifar. And it just kept growing. You know, I got a house and with a big garage and started adding tools to it and started going to knife shows and Every year it got bigger and bigger and then published more. But, you know, every year I would get another Japanese magazine article and the Internet was starting to take off. So that was starting to show up. And then when I would do knife shows, I had kind of the thing these the modern knife makers get where people would come and put their names in a hat and do lotteries. And okay. but this is all going back into the early 2000s. Um, show me, <clears throat> show us, excuse me, uh, the knife we were looking at before we started rolling here. The, uh, so this is representative of the kind of work you were doing back then. Right. Okay. So that's a hold, model hold, seven. Hold that up close to your, uh, yeah. Uh, look at that. That's gorgeous. It's an original model seven. Now this turned into the Columbia river knife and tool model seven, which is still being made to this day. 20 years later always love that little that little knife now that knife looks substantially smaller than this this is also a chisel ground blade which i love and um uh and and 
interesting about knives, uh, folding knives, tactical knives being made at that time. Larger scale, four inch was sort of the standard. Uh, that has right. kind of come down over over time. So it's cool to see that piece because it represents um, kind of your breakout style, if you will, uh, the style of knife you were making back then. And it's a gr and it's a great um, and plus it carries through with the CRKT, but it's also a great thing to look at when we're looking at your current work, you know, to kind of compare and see how you've grown from there. So what right. was it like? What was it like working at Surefire? What did you do there? Well, I had a number of positions there. I, I started off in tech support and repairs and kind of wrote the, the applications book for uh, warranty and repairs. And then from there, I moved on to engineering, did a lot of patent research and designing like the, the system matrix for the rail lights, um, stuff like that, specialty projects for the owner. And then Cameron had come on to board at to Surefire as the VP of sales and marketing. And I got called into the office one day and he goes, guess what? We're going to have a night division. You're in charge. Oh. Just like that. And the, basically this was the rules of engagement. Uh, buy what you need to be successful and don't bother us. And that was Ooh. it. So man, that's yeah. a, that's a, that's a dream situation or, or seemingly who, who knows. Uh, but that seems like a great way to start anyway. It was interesting. You know, it was, it was a tough 10 years. Um, there was a good amount of design by committee, you know, mm, which mm. you get a lot of, you know, you can be the, the one with, uh, you could be the subject matter expert and still have the smallest dick in the room. You know yeah, what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I, I do that. That's, uh, you know, real collaboration is a blessing, you know, when it's a, when it's a cooperative thing, but when you have too many cooks in the kitchen, there's always, everyone always feels like they have to contribute and what that means is they have to say, well, that's wrong and you should change it and make it look like this so that they feel like they've not been the useless person sitting in the room. Right. Um, and, and when it comes to product design, that can be a problem. You know, that can that can be a real problem. But so at as as the guy who was handed the reins that had never existed before. Right. Like now you're in charge of knives. We're doing knives now right. and you're in charge. How did you figure out or research what the knife buying public at the time wanted? And and you know, I keep I keep framing it in the modern context because right now you can easily do that kind of research. Um, because there are so many people reviewing knives and stuff like that now on Instagram, on YouTube, and elsewhere. Um, you can find out what what the prevailing trends are. But at, at that time, how did you build their brand of knife? So here is the first Surefire Alpha. This was the original model. And you can see the, the zigzaggy stuff in the frame, which had never been done before. I had this knack for doing texture. You know, I, I had kind of made a decision early on that if you were going to carry a folding fighting knife, and its job was to be a fighting knife, then it's got to be a certain size. It's got to have a certain blade length. You know, it has to be a substantial tool. And it wasn't until a little later that all of that stuff got scaled down. I think it, it might have been because of uh, Les Robertson had these, these tactical knife builds where he would contact a maker and have them make a certain number of something. And at that point, I was already sending everything to Japan and it was going for crazy money. So I wasn't included in that, but there was, everything kept getting smaller and smaller. And uh, I think like so many people, when Ernest Emerson did the CQC six, which was a very small knife, it was a very carryable small knife that became the the size model for everybody that wanted to buy knives but not necessarily carry them they were going into knife pouches and trading at shows um the bigger knives for anybody that was carrying one to be a weapon it seemed that they were carrying bigger stuff mm. um so i never really 
change my spots. You know, I kept making things that were on the bigger side simply because I, I designed it as a kind of an internal mission statement. I'm going to make this thing. What's the point location going to be? How am I going to engage it? How am I going to deploy it? What's the methodology? And that was the outline, right? The profile. And then everything that fit into that profile profile were details. Mm -hmm. And those details could be bead blasted or it could be crazy anodized with a bunch of machine texture. But I kind of uh, set this mission statement up that you're going to make a fighting knife and that's how I'm going to go from there. Let's let's talk about the profile for a second. Bring out the uh, bring out the alpha for a second. Um, and and actually, as you do, Jim is scrolling through your page on Arizona Custom Knives, and um, right. there there are a lot of knives in, that you can see. You can see all sorts of uh, cultural, ethnographic inspiration, and I love that. It, so in this one right, right here, uh, hold that up so we can see. It has an unusual. I'm sorry. Uh, open it, please. And then and then hold it up because I want to. It has an unusual profile with that with that it, uh, blade to handle angle. You know what I mean? That downward right. angle had uh, like a kukri. Yeah, like a kukri or or a, a one of the Filipino swords or. Um, so you know, so far we've seen two of your knives, but both of them older designs. But this carries through to today. The inspirations for these, this and the and the uh, Model Seven you were showing before, are are from history and other cultures. That's Talk about yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, look, the Filipino knife fighting's been around for a long time, hundreds and hundreds of years, right? Thousands, maybe. I don't know. Um, they know how to cut up other people with knives. They're very good at it. And why should I reinvent the wheel? Um, now, a lot of these things had not been done as folding knives, right? But I think that those blade shapes are so iconic. Why not just make a version that fits into a folding frame? And some things just have to be big. You know, some things like you need a real handle. You know, you need something you can hold on to. And I've done things with geometry of knives where I've cropped away the top surface on knives in order to you know, like normally on a knife like this, there would be more material up here concealing mm -hmm. all this. I've done the best I can to trim everything away or have, you know, backstops that allow for this appearance that there's more blade than handle. Yeah. Um, just fucking with geometry. Basically. You can really see that. That's one of the, so uh, I, I I say this all the time, um, but I'm really re like the looks of a knife are very important to me because uh, they just resonate, you know, one way or, or another. And 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 uh, for me, handle to blade ratio is always important to me. It just looks wonky if it's if it's if it's not. And and that's one of the things I've noticed about your work. And then reading reading some uh, old posts on blade forums, other people mentioned that as well like a seeming one-to-one -one, uh handle to blade ratio on a lot of your folders uh, yeah i try and make it so that something my dear friend chris reeve who is a mentor and friend of mine taught me sitting over a beer at the california custom knife show when i was 21 he said stevie keep in mind you're selling entertainment he goes, you're not just making a knife for a guy's pocket. You're selling entertainment. And he goes, every time you make a knife and that guy comes into your place and he drops down his hard-earned cash for something you made, one, it's got to be perfect. And two, he needs to think it's the coolest thing he's ever made, he's ever seen. And he also think, needs to think that every time he looks at it from a different direction, he sees something new. Hmm. Because you're selling entertainment. Right. You know, the guy's going to sit there and play with this. You know, he's going to goof with it and show his friends and he's going to be the guy with the cooler knife at the bar. Um, that's done. You know, some of the things I do as far as it's going to be a weapon. Right. That's a specific task and where the edge geometry and everything goes and how it's going to deploy. 
is first, but the entertainment part of it is also very, very important. You know, it's like, what does the guy see when he looks inside the knife? Is it machined inside and out? You know, when he's dicking with this sitting in front of the TV and he's looking with it, this, this one I apparently have eaten with and not cleaned, but, um, you know, every time he looks at it, it's gotta be interesting. And yet when you want a folding fighting knife, there's one there, you know what I mean? Short. And yeah. Short yeah. And it's, 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 it's in a way like hanging a uh, painting on the wall, you know, you're going to live with that painting for years. And every time right. you look at it, you want to you want to see familiar things that your eyes uh, like to go to. And then you also want to discover new things. And, uh, you know, that's that's uh, I've been recently buying more and more uh, custom knives, uh, fixed blades. And part of part of my uh, enjoyment in that is that they are handmade. And no matter how refined the build you can see when something is handmade and and i don't know that adds a, that adds something to it well something that happened gradually um over say the last 10 years is the the new class of cnc knife makers which is a skill set i don't have i wish i did but i have cnc mills and i can do some stuff on them but primarily you know the cycle start button is a scary bitch you know because it turns out if you tell it to do the wrong thing it will and then you see sparks and tools break and you know hmm. um that is a chris reeve was really the guy that started that and then kind of morphed into ken onion doing it and then jens anzo and you know a whole bunch of other people but now i mean my goodness there's you know, 40, 50 guys I don't even know that are doing amazing stuff on, you know, Tormach and small Haas office mills and things like that, that um, I ultimately uh, have a tremendous respect for. I, of course, will always, you know, give some sass and say there's no sweat equity in that, right? Because I'm in there on a pantograph cutting the stuff, but the the reality is, some of those guys are drinking a beer where their machines do their job. You know, I, on the other hand, am, you know, eating metal and wondering why I never learned how to make work my machine. So <laughs> it's a different skill set. Yeah. And I have respect for it, but you know, I, and the other six of us left and still make knives by hand. You know, I, I have a little extra respect for us. Hey, Jim, can you scroll back up? Oh, there you are with uh, Douglas Esposito. He's great. I have My one of boy. his. Uh, I have two of his knives. I have a, uh, I have a medium fighter, double edged. Uh, stop right there, if you would, Jim. I have a medium uh, fighter, double edged, sweet with uh, with tortoiseshell hands uh, handles, and then I have one of his folders, uh, Mark One. Uh, I something I wanted to ask you. Okay, this middle row here. You you have these crazy S curve knives, right. and then the the one on the on the end. Um, on the right, I'm sorry, Jim. On the right end, that one. Uh, can you click mm -hmm. on that? Look at that model thing. Two. I mean, so this is a double-edged uh, thing that you <laughs> thing implement of chaos that you've made. Um, I... That was that was designed by a surgeon that uh -huh. works. He was a Mayo Clinic surgeon, and uh, he was single. You know, he's the kind of guy that had a. A Chevy Nova with a sixty thousand dollar engine in it, and uh, an Acura NSX, and you know, hundred thousand dollar stereo. He was a customer of mine at Surefire, and a brilliant dude. And he was a good customer. He was very highly trained, trained all the time. And he wanted a knife that was double edged. Mm -hmm. um, and he drew that on a piece of paper at um, B and B Guns, and I made it for him. That was. Uh, he think he was really inspired by Emerson's Rhino because that had been okay. brand new at the time. Uh -huh. that, that there was lots of stuff Ernie inspired me on, believe me, but that wasn't one of them. That was something that Stan drew and I made for him, and it turned out to stick. You know, people there weren't a lot of double edged folders. I mean, double edged folders themselves have a potential for cutting you up you know what i mean I yeah, I, yeah I, mean, I, I can only think of three right now uh that are not full custom you know 
I, I, right. There, there, are, there are not many. Hinderer makes one. Arcane Design makes one. Sharp by Design makes one. You know, and they're all daggers. Right. They're all symmetrical. You know. Right. Um, but I love the idea of just uh, you know the the clip portion of a clip blade that folds into a deeply nestle. You know, nestles into right. a handle enough that. I love that idea. You just don't see it, though. And I think probably because there's legality issues that people don't want to fight. There's a lot of... When you go back to the mission statement that you're going to make a folding weapon, right? And that's what it's going to be for. There is some... There is a little bit of... I'm going to find something to show you. There is a little bit of uh, grace that you give your operator that he's going to take the time to learn how to use the tool you made. Mm. So if you're making a knife for the public where some guy's going to walk in with no training and he doesn't know what he's doing, then a knife like that's scary because if it comes open in your pocket, you will cut your hand. It's like having a butterfly knife without a, a clasp, you know, and you reach into your back pocket and you find the point of that knife with the cuticle of your finger. It's, mm. it's not a lot of fun. And double-edged folder is one of those things where that can sure happen um and we we make those work by having really stiff ball detents and or you know maybe a different kind of lock mechanism but just about everything's a frame lock or a liner lock um mm -hmm. i i look at it like if you're going to have a knife that can be dangerous to carry okay um it's not for everybody. It's for, and typically the guys that buy them know that they want it because it's that, right. you know, they want it because they want the capability, not, not for just because I have been really fortunate as a knife maker and sometimes not as fortunate, right. That typically my stuff isn't going to collectors as much, you know, I still have a, fairly good size core group of people that carry my knives you know they're buying them as a tool and you know yeah some of them end up in collections because they're a tremendous amount of money on the secondary market but most guys that i deal with nowadays they're not buying them to flip them there's nobody running to my table and putting their name in a hat to go you know for the opportunity to buy one it's guys that are like oh man i love this and it, into their pocket it goes right and it's part of their everyday carry stuff. Um, it's one of the reasons I do stuff that nobody else does because I can, I'm not, I'm absolutely not chasing trends. You know, there's, there's a number of things that have happened in the last eight to 10 years. And specifically since Instagram happened, you know, that have made knife making have to follow a certain set of rules and the fans of those guys that are, setting those rules are going to defend their investments because sometimes they're tremendous and they're going to defend their fans, their knife makers with as much venom as you can imagine. And, you know, I never, I didn't come up during that. I came up during the time where it was, you made knives and your dealers bought them and they went to those people that carried them. Right. It wasn't yeah. not so much you, you know what I mean? But now right. anymore, my customers are all buying stuff for themselves. And if it's trading on the secondary market, it's typically at just a couple of places, Monkey Edge or Arizona Custom Knives. And people know to go there because that's where yeah. they end up, you know. So what uh, what trends have you observed um, in the knife world recently that stick in your craw? Well, Okay. That's tough because I can be an opinionated prick. Everybody knows that. It's okay. This is not the place. That's not the place I'm going to do that. You know, I, that's something, that's a talk we have with a beer and I'm not going to bad mouth anybody because you know All what, right. if somebody's going to give up a football game or give up a memory or an experience to go out in their garage and grind metal and make it into something, I'm going to give them brownie points for that. Cause you know what? It takes some time. It takes some effort, you know, and to make something perfect, it takes a shit ton of time, you know, and I have a methodology and a standard of fit and finish and tool marks and stuff, which allow me to make knives within a time frame 
with the, so that I'm making a admirable billable rate in the shop. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you can go higher and you can go lower from those standards. Okay. Um, if there's anything that sticks in my craw, it's dishonesty. It's guys that aren't making their own parts. It's guys that are having their blades ground for them by other knife makers because they don't know how. It's guys that are belt sanding water jet parts to contour with no other work, just literally belt sanding the parts and charging $2,000, $3,000 for a $300 knife. Now I could use the money. I kind of wish I had that. I don't, you know, but there is some, I don't know the word it's, there is a bit of stuff that's happening and um, that you kind of wonder, it's like, wow, I don't know what I do. You know, I, I guess you have your heyday and there's things that, or it's like, here's a good one that I think is just silly floating backspacers. <laughs> floating backspacers are a thing. You know why they're a yeah, thing? Yeah. Because a guy buys a bar of, uh, what do we call it? Not damas steel, but they buy a bar of like uh, Zerku tie or titanium Timascus. That's the word I'm looking for, right? So they buy that thing and they don't have the tools they need to cut it themselves. So they take this $300, $400 bar of metal and they send it to the water jet guy who cuts this thing out for them, or mostly, and then sends it back to them. Now they have these odd shapes of Zerkutai that is not thick enough to make a fast spacer because you, you know typically they're making this out of three sixteenths ish thick you know thickness and your back spacer if you're gonna follow the current trends you know your blade can't be an eighth inch thick it's gotta be at least two hundred thousandths you know it's gotta be thick because customers like thick and then you have to grind it on a fixture down to razor blade thin. So it's like, why did you buy all that metal and then grind it away and then have something that was so inherently weak that if you cut a zip tie with it, it would bend? Tell me why that's logical, right? It's because they don't have it. They know their knives are never going to be used, ever. They know they can get away with it. So the floating backspacer happens because they have this extra, very expensive material that is not thick enough to make the backspacer for their knife. So they have to make tiny little washers in order to make up for the distance of the blade thickness and the washer stack. But I, I do think that it maybe th that it has developed into a thing unto itself. Uh, That's you know, correct. Like ripped jeans or something. And I'm, I'm not comparing it I to, agree. to ripped look, jeans. I do, I do like the things. look of a floating backspacer, I must admit. Everybody <laughs> but, likes the looks of it, but that's why it's there. You know, right, right, it's right. because the material... Look, I'm a guy that designs knife blade shapes into the leftover pieces in a laser web because that material is expensive. When I was young and coming up, just to save money, I used to go to True Grit Abrasives, the shirt, mm -hmm. and I would go to his scrap bin, which were all the cutoffs of ATS-34. Like, they would get a six-and-a-half-foot bar because it was a little bit random coming from Japan, and... They would cut a number of three foot bars and there would be this box there of odds and ends. And I would get all that at a discount. Oh, so awesome. then I would improvise and design stuff into those squares. And then one day I said, well, I'm not going to design into a rectangle anymore. So I would buy whole sheets of metal and then nest them and then saw the entire thing on my bandsaw. You know, sometimes spend an entire day on a saw there was no place where there was more than an eighth of an inch between saw cuts. I bought a very nice saw. It cuts really well. So, you know, I could maximize the material that way. Um, I have no problem with people making stuff out of things, but to call it a feature when ultimately it's a function of using up scrap and then defending it tooth and nail. Well, that's a really important thing. Why is it that way? Uh, maybe so wind can blow through the frame. I don't know, right? That's something that people have made into a thing 
but it's not because what they said it was. It's the, there's there's a number of those things like uh, what's another one? Grinding blades thinner than I would possibly grind a blade. That's one thing. Um, yeah, thin and slicey, uh, or, or or super um, heavy duty blades have given way to thin, super slicey blades uh, amongst the, uh, uh, you know, well, I mean, very popularly. People like super thin blades right. now, and the thin behind the edge measurement is something that a lot of people do in their review videos. I don't know how they, how they, I can never get my caliper. And then once, you know, uh, but it is interesting. It's really important to people. Uh, and it, it's funny how, um, it's funny how things catch on and kind of, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know exactly what I mean, but, or I, I know what I mean. I can't quite say it. It's like, uh, you had the hinderer strider, um, uh, um, earlier super overbuilt stuff uh, right. give way to the very very gentlemanly easily carried stuff and um uh kind of in the pop popular thing I, I and i and i think that that happens through customer feedback you have people reviewers you have um people liking the thin behind the edge uh sort of thing it's just funny how these trends pick up it's still a cutting tool you know I don't, I don't think it comes from customers. Um, what I think it is because, you know, I've, I've spent my career making unique items and they were unique because I'm weird. Okay. You know what I mean? I, I think about things a little bit different and, you know, I've been told I was ahead of my time many, many times, uh, and you know, design elements that I did 20 years ago are commonplace now. And it's not because I thought 20 years from now this is going to happen. It's just because I'm weird, you know, and it made sense. It was logical. But there are other things that have taken cha taken hold because you have a number of guys in the room and they all have a similar equipment set. You know, they have, you know, a belt grinder, a drill press, a uh, Harbor Freight or, a, you know, some sort of bench top, mill drill, um, maybe a bandsaw, like, but usually like a horizontal bandsaw where they're going to sit on it like a seesaw and put the little cutting table on there. And ultimately, they're showing that they have something that the guy next to them doesn't. And in a room filled with belt sanded to perfection water jet parts, I don't think this is as true now as it was, say, maybe four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. But you had a whole bunch of cats that were like, oh, my God, this is the dot-com era of custom knives. And they're like, I'm going to do this. And they watched some YouTube videos and they, you know, got water jet parts made and uh, had people grind blade blanks for them. And they started putting knives together. And what could they do that was more innovative than the guy next to them? Well, hey, I'm going to grind my blade thinner. Or I'm going to grind a chisel grind from one side. You know, they, they had to come up with a thing. And enough internet stuff happens now that if you have a knife maker that, you know, got in early on Instagram and has, you know, 60,000 followers and he sells eight knives a month or 10 knives a month for, you know, he's making a living doing it or he's got a day job and this is what he does for fun. People will protect those investments and people will think it's cool because it was expensive. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's good or bad. I just noticed that, you know, there was a time where, you know, you could walk down the aisles and it's still that way. If you walk down the aisles of the blade show, my knives stand out different than everybody else in the room. And that's just because I'm weird and I have a different aesthetic and what I think is cool. Um, but I don't know that any of those trends such as early lockups or knives that are flipper only deploying or, you know, inserts on lock mechanisms, all of these trends that sweep through the, through the knife maker universe some of them are for real and some of them are because 
they became popular just because they became popular. I, I think you, um, you know, when you when you touched on some people will think that it's great because it's expensive. Um, you know, you see that you see a lot of people like that in every sector of enthusiast um, materialism. True. You know, that's what this is. These are all luxury items. Let's be clear. Um, oh, for but, sure. But um, I think with knife uh, enthusiasts such as myself, I am not uh, I'm not dis, you know, uh, precluding myself from this but um it that sort of thing of saying like if it's expensive it's good gets coded or veiled in materials well it's m390 and m390 is expensive so it's an expensive knife or you know uh various handle materials and such so so the crassness of liking something for its expensiveness is disguised in the apparent love or you know in the love of materials and i gotta say i mean i have fallen victim to that myself where i'll be like you know why why, why would i you know why would i pay 200 dollars for a, a knife with this perfectly good blade steel when i could pay 200 dollars for a different knife with this even more perfectly good blade steel right you know there is uh there's definitely something to the steel of the month you know, Sal Glesser was a friend of mine. And when I was running Surefire's knife division, I wasn't publishing what steel was in it. It was in some models, it was S30V. It was in the catalog, but it wasn't on the blade. And Sal called me one day and he's like, Steve, it's very important that you put the blade steel on there. Nothing could be more important because that was part of his marketing thing. It was like, oh. you need to tell them this is the cool flavor this year. This is this year's blade. Um, I know that I've made more knives than used them other than in the kitchen. <laughs> right? yeah, yeah. I've made a lot more than used them. Right. Um, and I don't think, I think there's definitely some voodoo to which, which things, which is the hot steel of the month, but I'll be quite frank to tell you, I wouldn't know the difference between 390 and S 90 because I just don't pay attention. I, I have, I don't care, you know. It's yeah. I like ATS thirty four and one fifty four CM and CPM one fifty four and S thirty V. I use the stuff that I've always used. Um, people have sent me L Max and some other uh, expensive things, which and I look at it and I go, well, I don't heat treat my own stuff, so if I make a knife out of that, I'm just going to cost me three hundred dollars to heat treat it for a minimum batch. So you know there it sits on the shelf i don't do you, do you don't send it to a, trends. do you send it to true grit to get heat treated no no i oh, have oh, uh, okay. i make I've, blades I, I have. In, yeah i make blades in bigger batches oh. you know when i and i only do it a couple of times a year so oh. um just this last month you know when i wanted to make blades i made 70 or 80 blades and then i sent them off to heat treat oh, okay and then you know, and very often I'll make 10 of a blade shape and build up three, you know, and stick my finger in the wind and see if anybody else wants the other three. And sometimes no, right? So then then those other blades sit. And that's why I have what's called the wall of shame out in the shop where it's, <laughs> you know, uh, a whole decades of knife design, which if you're an aficionado, you'd be like, oh, I remember that from this magazine. I remember that's because uh -huh. I made 10 blades 20 years ago, and then my ADD kicked in, and I made two of them, and then I took off and made the next three. It has paid off in the, this current modern thing where it's like, well, I don't have to buy I don't have to go spend any money on new stuff because – I'm just pulling stuff off the shelf and then yeah. Finishing. Oh, I mean, I mean, at this point in your career, you you have a a storied career. You got you got so many designs. You can now be reaching into the archives and pulling things out, kind of a lot like the uh, the Model Seven you were showing. Those were all old twenty year old parts when you assembled yeah. that knife. Um, uh, so what are you working on right now? And and what what are kind of the things that you're uh, what are the what are the creative knife problems you're looking to solve? What are you trying to do, and what are you working on now? Hmm. Let me uh, turn off my overhead fan because it's giving me some audio issues. Sure. Okay. Well, I like to be innovative. Um, 
I don't have a lot of the things that I just shipped. I just shipped the customers from, um, like literally today I shipped stuff out. I like knives that are, you know, if I'm going to carry a small fixed blade, I'll show you one of these. This is uh, a knife I call the dart. I was making sheets today. So these are oh, tape so you're taking the, the tape off the blade. Right. So here's a dart. Oh, this, you've been posting these. I love these. Yeah. So this is, this is a knife I, I really dig. It's kind of a Quaken Canto type thing. And this is the kind of thing I, I like to make. I think that fixed blades are badass. Um, making 10 at a time takes too much time. I don't like when I do that because it takes away time from folders. Um, S center but, that, I'm sorry, center that up in the middle of the screen and just kind of hold it still so we can. Yeah, that's nice. That's really nice. I like that Python micarta on there. I know. So, it's really so cool. Is, is that double edged? Yes. Yeah. Well, it's tapered on the back. Right. So it could so, easily be sharpened. Well, so typically, if you look at the width of the grind, mm -hmm. it would be really hard to make something with that short a, a swedge cut very well. Right. Um, you could lacerate, right? But you're not yeah, going to size gouge and scrape right. and do other kind of nasty stuff. But that that is a really so. Uh, what is the treatment, the surface treatment on the blade itself? Oh man, that's a secret. Oh, I'll okay. tell you what the secret is. You walk over, you clean the thing, you take it up to about 220 grit, okay? And then scotch bright it so it's nice and bright, which you could deliver perfectly happily, okay? Mm -hmm. And then you go over to your Makino milling machine where it has open spillways for the machine oil. And you take a towel and you dip it in the, the, the dirty oil. And then you walk over and you go like this, tap, 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 tap. And then you put it in your acid and you get what's called night hunter finish. You get that splash etched. Look. Night hunter. There's finish. lots of ways to do it. Okay. Put it, put it right up to the screen so we can see it. I just want people to see this. It looks really cool. And I, yeah, that looks really cool. I generally am not a huge fan of too much stuff on the blade. I, uh, I very much dig that, uh, that surface treatment. That's really cool. Well, and the other thing is it's it's not that deep. Like if you goof one up, you can refinish that, and, you know, like a few tenths on the surface grinder on bowl, on the flats and then, you know, another 220 pass. You know, you could fix that if you didn't like what it looks like without removing too much material. They're only in the acid for six or seven minutes. So they're not, okay. it's not very long. The other trick that gives you some very interesting finishes is um i will grab a knife is if you have a little bit of oil left over on the top of your acid because you have uh been sticking other coated knives in there <laughs> so you have mm -hmm. you have not you have a little slick of oil sitting on the top oh, and yes. then when you dip your knife blade in there some knife steels and they're not all the same will grab that oil and kind of distribute it in this drizzle pattern swirls and you can see the grain ats34 is really good at that um i'm trying to find wait what'd you just open you can't just open it and then not show oh it. well it didn't have the finish on it. that's a bulldog <laughs> bulldog is one of my principal edc knives yeah. um and this is that same effect where if you notice the top I've cut away all the stuff at the top. Right. So that when you all the close way around the blade, that pivot. right, it looks very small. And it carries small too. You know, this knife is not much bigger than the palm of your hand, but when you deploy it, it it has a very large spear point blade. Mm hmm That's a really nice but, looking blade, too. Thank you. Yeah, this one's been a popular one for me. I've got a flipper one coming. Uh, I made some blanks to make do a flipper version also. Uh, I, I want to ask you this um, before we wrap up that this uh, keeps coming up and I keep forgetting to ask, but 
we've been t- we were talking about trends. We were talking about the knife world, and and also we're gonna we're gonna talk about some more stuff on the Patreon extras. So if you sure. want to hear some more conversation with uh, with Steve Ryan, check out uh, check us out on Patreon because I have a couple of other questions I want to I want to talk to him about. But I want to get this one uh, answered right here, which is we were talking about people using uh, CNC mills. We're, you know, right. we're talking about people doing everything by hand. What about um, the trend of, or the, not the trend, but the um, designers, just designers who make stuff on CAD and then have it, have it built elsewhere. Have you noticed um, uh, a, an uptick in that? And um, what do you think of some of the knives you've been seeing? Well, so initially when I was um, coming up, there were only really two of them. There was Leong Ma and Joel Perella. And they did cool stuff. Um, Leong, I think Joel is doing his own thing now. He's not doing knives anymore. And Leong has done quite well with that. Um, I've had my head very buried in, you know, two simultaneous careers up until recently. You know what I mean? Up until um just the last year and a half when I left Surefire, I haven't had time to really think about it. And it's only been something I've noticed on Instagram with, you know, guys that are have a lot of time to post things on Instagram because they're not working at making knives. I think it's great if they can do it. You know what I mean? I, I do think that there is a tremendous amount of very high quality stuff coming out of China and through you know small factories I yeah. moved a little. so i don't really have one good or bad thing to say about it i just know that you know if if that's your skill set if if you're unable to do it yourself and you could make a business model of having somebody else's labor do it um it seems to be a very popular thing all over america now cuz yeah. You know, that, that ability to make your own things is a lot less than sending it over to China to get made. You know, yeah. it's, it's a different yeah. business model. I didn't mean to set you up, like, uh, to pitch you against uh, designers like that. Actually, what, what, what I have noticed is that that sort of way of having knives produced uh, is is a is a is a kind of a genre. Not, that's not the right term, but it's it's sort of like a style of knife making unto itself. Uh, like there is the knife maker, like yourself, who does a lot by hand and panograph and and uh, and those tools. And then there's people who uh, write code and program, you know, design things and program CNC machines and have their mills. And then there are people, you know. This third tier are are aficionados with CAD, and and the the blessing is that there is technology out there and skilled uh, skilled workers out there to produce these knives. Unfortunately, it's not happening in the United States. But all of that, but that aside, it's a it's a place where a young a young designer, just a designer who's good at CAD, can be very very creative, and basically work everything out in this virtual space and uh and then send it off and boom it's made and 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 uh made to a very high quality so in a way it's a it's a it's almost like a different sort of form of artistic expression well i would say yes but you know keep in mind also that i worked for 22 years with a whole crew of very talented engineers that did that every day Mm-hmm. The design products very often were never made or, you know, one created new stuff all the time, didn't know how to do it themselves, right? They, they designed it on CAD and then sent it off to where the, the machine shop guys were, right? I was really fortunate in that I got to do both. You know, I mean, I, I didn't get the nickname Da Vinci with the milling machine by sitting at a desk with the mouse. You know what I mean? I got out there and made parts and designed them in my head. I didn't have much aptitude. I did the uh, the SolidWorks class, and I got through the basic class where I could do a block with holes in it and stuff. And what I found was uh, when I was designing mounts and rail interfaces and gun parts primarily, it was much easier just to design it in my noggin 
figure out the work holding, you know, and then know which machine I was going to build them on. Like if we were going to build it on a GS 200, then I knew I had 16 tools and I had a sub spindle and I knew how I was going to hold it. So I would design it on three axis machines to be made on 16 axis machines. But when I handed them that part, I knew very well, I could write out, these are the tools you're going to use. This is the sequence. This is where you're going to grab it. So it was nothing to take that component, you know, even after I've beta tested it and had the customers deploy with it and come back and, you know, it was no big deal to take that directly to engineering and say, clean up the numbers, you know, and then make that part. Um, I had a very unique experience that most people don't to be given the keys to the kingdom with, you know, $500,000 worth of machinery and, some ability, which became a good ability over a decade of constant doing it, to do something pretty cool. Um, most guys don't have that opportunity. You know, they have yeah. their CNC. My my CNC friend, that my teacher, a guy that worked for me, was just busting my balls yesterday, saying, "Look, you have those machines in your garage. You need to quit being fat and so tired." get out there and make your machines work for you. And it's like, dude, trust me. I don't want to see sparks. I can't afford to fix it if I crash it. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's uh, the time hasn't passed, but it's like something I don't have at this moment. So, uh, and, well, and the designers themselves get dirty. Fuck, you know, go out there and grind something, you know, what, what what can we expect from from Steve Ryan Knives in the in the future? What what uh, what what kind of designs? What kind of things are you looking to do um, coming up? Well, I'm going to be doing a bunch of I wouldn't say repeat stuff. You know, like I made this the other day, this folding oh. call. Yes, I, I made these that. for customers. This was the scrap, a scrap left over inside the uh, a sheet. And I'm like, I know what that is. I've always been, I've done this long enough to where the creative process was really easy for me. Like, you know, I would see a piece of, you know, thing, you go, tweezers. And then I would make tweezers or I would, right. you know, see, I would just be able to create something. So in this case, this Pakal thing is, popular so i just made a couple i've got a few to send out to customers and a couple of other ones uh it is a bit of an interesting knife because as i made the first one i always thought i would grind this all the way up here to make it look cool mm -hmm. but then just edge it here what lies underneath the handle um and then as i was playing with it i didn't like putting my hand on this ground, but even though not edged part. Mm -hmm. So the other customers, since I just ground them further up, the other pickles on the market are basically reversed. The, right. the, the sharp right. part closes into the handle, but then you got to rotate it over in your hand if you're going to deploy it. Where mine, yeah. you just flick and you're ready to do so. Yeah. It's an interesting thing I'm that's growing on me. Oh, I'm a, I'm a, uh, I'm a big fan of pickle knives. I have a uh, I have a number of them. I think it's a uh, cool and well, I I love it for its aesthetics, but also it's it's a it's a great it's a seemingly great way to use a knife if you're all of your uh, you know fine motor skill collie stuff goes out the door in the in the moment of truth. Um, I like I, push daggers. I, oh, push daggers! I like push daggers. Yeah, you, you designed one for Surefire, didn't you? Yeah. Um... I designed a modular one for a Surefire years ago. And then I made some with my own brand. Just as we were closing uh, one of my divisions, I made up a batch of hmm. these. Those are, that's so cool. Just before I sold my machine to Kershaw Knives. So... That's I like push sweet. daggers just because if you need to make a hole in somebody, that's what you do. I like karambits. They're cool, but I don't have enough training with them to really yeah. be that efficient. Although, I mean, I designed the first folding karambit 
20 years ago and then sat down with the people at Columbia River Knife and Tool at the the blade show or the uh, shot show in 2000 and we decided it wasn't a good risk of an investment mm -hmm. and then the next year it became the hottest thing out there you know rick came out with his and leon drew it and rick hinderer did his and emerson did his and um you know the following year after everybody made money me and paul from crkt paul's like well let's do it now and i'm like it's kind of late and i said that project is you know, two years, birth to grave. You know, it's there's, yeah. you know, you're too late to the game. You had the chance, right, to do yeah. it. Something so, like a something like a karambit has to involve a lot of R and D because of hand sizes and ring sizes and ring positioning and all that stuff. And uh, I would imagine, yeah, that's a that's a two year. I I can show you the original one that started the whole thing. I think, yeah, here. So originally, when I designed it, remember when I was talking about there is a certain amount of training that is to be expected from the operator, okay? Like he's going to need, if he's going to carry a weapon, it's going to be short and to the point. So here's, this is one of my folding karambits. Ooh, that's cool. This is one with a integral ring. And then the original one is in this bag somewhere, possibly. No, oh, well. I don't hey, see you know it what? Here. That's a that's a good uh, that's a good out for us. If you want to okay. see this uh, this karambit uh, stick around, join us on Patreon. We're going to do a little, a uh, little bit of extra with Steve Ryan and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe when we cut, he'll find it and we'll take a look at it there. Hey, Steve, it's been a pleasure meeting you and it's been a pleasure talking about your time in the knife world. And, uh, I got some other, uh, other questions I'm going to ask you. Uh, but, but, uh, yeah, it's been a real pleasure, sir. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Oh, it, anytime, anytime. And, uh, uh, well, I can't wait to see what you got cooking up next. And, uh, well, we'll, we'll see that in a few minutes. All right, everybody. Thank Watch you, me on Instagram. <laughs> uh, yeah. Be check interesting. Out, yeah. Yeah. Actually, uh, sorry. Sorry. I did not mention that. Uh, you are a great follow on Instagram because not only do you get to see all these really super cool knives that you design and make, but you, you do a lot of process shots. And to me, that stuff is very interesting. I love seeing inside uh, the work in progress uh, portion of the shop of the people that make the knives I love. Right. Well, it's the Steve Ryan, the underscore Steve underscore Ryan. That's it's because I'm a dork. I also have Steve Ryan knives and I never populated it. So that's because I also own Steve Ryan knives.com and ran at a airspeed and altitude and haven't populated <laughs> that either. I've been uh, going well, nonstop since I moved. So the, the web will keep it and keep it uh, warm for you. Right. All righty, Steve. Thanks for coming on the show, sir. Thank you, sir. All right. Do you carry multiple knives, then overthink which one to use when an actual cutting chore pops up? You're a knife junkie of the first order. There he goes, Steve Ryan. And like I said, uh, if you're interested in some of these, uh, some of this information, uh, you can check it out in some of our interview extras. Uh, I, I always love that CRKT Model 7, but to see the actual four inch bladed uh, version with what looked like Westinghouse, my card, I got to ask him what, what that handle uh, was absolutely beautiful. I love the chisel grind and I love that barong shape. So it was great to have Steve Ryan on the show and to, and to get a view into uh, kind of where all of this stuff sprung up from um, that era. And uh, it's cool to see what he's doing now. Crazy work, crazy intricate work. Uh, so, there you have it. Uh, join us next week for another interview. And of course, Wednesday for the midweek supplemental to find out the new knives I've gotten Thursday night knives for our live, uh, live feed and uh, join the conversation there. And then of course, all of the podcast apps, you can, 
you can listen to us there too. All right, for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm-hmm.